In this lecture, we'll be looking at Domitian and Nerva. We'll begin by looking at the reign and then the death of Domitian with particular attention to the Flavian building program in Rome. And then we'll turn to the reign of Nerva, who was the first of the five so-called good emperors, and look at Nerva's adoption of Trajan and the way that this creates a new principle of succession. So Domitian is declared emperor in 81 upon the death of his brother Titus, despite the fact that he's relatively unprepared to take office. He had not been particularly successful as a military man in the way that Titus was. He had held none of the same kinds of, of offices, of governmental offices that Titus had that prepared him to take over from his father Vespasian. Domitian was, in some real way, the accidental emperor. He quickly became fairly reminiscent of Nero. He alienated the Senate. He took the title Dominus et Deus, which translates Lord and God or Master and God. A Dominus was a master of slaves. Um, so this was a, a fairly offensive title. Um, this was not pater, father which is the title, for instance, that Augustus takes when he's pater patriae. But rather, this is Domitian claiming, as a living being, he is a master of people and a god. He stands far, far above everybody else. He also alienated the Senate by wearing the triumphal outfit in the Senate, triumphal garb, despite the fact that, again, unlike his father and brother, he had not had a distinguished military career and was not really entitled to do so. Domitian was able to stay in office and to stay in office for a good 15 years, so even longer than his father Vespasian, because he did enjoy the support of the Roman people and the soldiers um, in particular. And so with that popular support and military support, it was hard to dislodge him. He also clearly had some support among the Senate. He did a lot to alienate most of the senators, but he had his favorites, and they did benefit under him and helped him maintain power. But the real source of his power was the people, so he was a populist in the same way that Nero was, but he also had the loyalty of the soldiers. And the loyalty of the soldiers came more because they were loyal to his family, um, to Vespasian, to Titus. And so Domitian was able to capitalize on that. He very quickly fashioned himself a second Augustus, and in a very interesting way, he in particular focused on morality. Um, he saw himself as ushering in a new golden age, so not unlike his father Vespasian, who saw himself as a second founder, a new Romulus, Domitian continues that, that mantra, that, that the Flavian family was restoring Rome to its, its former glory. And in Domitian's case, he particularly highlights the way that he is a second Augustus in terms of the building program activities, his interest in morality, and his patronage of literature and the arts. Um, he named himself censor in order to control mor morals, both in public and in private. Um, this was something that Augustus had done, but for the most part, the other emperors after Augustus had let it slide. So Domitian, interestingly, embraces this notion. He, on the sort of more um, governmental front, he revalued Roman coinage, which helped again with the economic crisis that the fire of 64 had brought. He strengthened border defenses and, in fact, even went out on campaign himself. And perhaps most memorably, he engaged in an extensive building program largely continuing buildings that were planned or begun by Vespasian and Titus, um, but also building things that commemorated his father and brother. You can see um, Domitian here in the, in the military pose, in the pose of Imperator. So perhaps the most famous construction of the Flavian family, begun by Vespasian and uh, finished by Domitian was what we know as the Colosseum, um, but it was called the Flavian Amphitheater. This was a huge amphitheater. So there were other theaters and amphitheaters 
in Rome, um, an amphitheater is just two theaters put together. So it's, it's a full round rather than half. Um, and beast fights, gladiatorial battles, and so forth would be fought in this. So the flooring there would have been covered um, by a, a floor and then by sand. Um, but the, that bottom sort of worn of, of um, buildings was where the animals would be kept, the slaves would be kept, and they would actually be pushed up through trap doors to spring up through onto the, the floor of the amphitheater. But the Roman amphitheater saw, seated an enormous number of people, um, somewhere in the neighborhood probably of about 50,000 or so. It was, at the time, the biggest in the Roman Empire. Um, and there would be some larger amphitheaters eventually constructed in the provinces, but this was, this was a, really a, a gem. Um, and it was very much something for the people. Um, this was where the people came and interacted, where they were entertained. Um, and it was up to the city's patrons, foremost the emperor himself, to provide that entertainment in the form of spectacles, beast hunts, um, battles. They would restage famous naval battles, um, all sorts of things. One of the other things that Domitian, that Domitian um, undertakes is a temple to Vespasian and Titus. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you have a reconstruction, and the right-hand side is showing what survives, just the little corner um, there of the portico. But the point of this temple was to show Domitian's respect for his family, for tradition, to show his pietas, um, his devotion to his father, um, and to show his family loyalty and to celebrate the Flavians. It was a way also of consolidating his power, of saying, I hold the Principate, perhaps not because of what I've done, but because of what my family's done. So it was important for him to align himself with his family members. The other thing that Domitian does to celebrate his brother Titus was have an arch constructed, a victory monument. Um, and this is one of the most famous victory monuments in the Roman Empire, the, Ar the Triumphal Arch of Titus. Um, and it celebrated Titus's exploits um, around the Roman Empire, but perhaps most importantly in Judea, when he sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Um, but again, this was a way of Domitian celebrating his brother. It was built after his brother's death, so it was a kind of death monument. But it was also a way for Domitian to, to really justify his own claim to the throne. And here you have some details from the triumphal arch on the left-hand side of your slide. Um, you see um, in, the, in the triumph the carrying of the, the menorah. Um, and then in the right-hand side, this is actually decorations um, from the roof. So even on the inside of the arch, it would have been richly adorned um, with various kinds of panels um, depicting Titus's, the highlights of his military career. One of the interesting things about the Arch of Titus is that when Israel was declared a state, one of the, the things that happened was that the the Jews that were living in Rome actually walked through the Arch of Titus, but they walked through it backwards. And the symbolism of this was that they were, re they were returning to Judea. So whereas the triumph celebrating the conquest of Judea marched through it, sort of through the, the Roman Forum in one direction, um, and celebrated the removal, the diaspora of the Jews, now the Jews living in Rome were celebrating their return um, and in some sense their release from the Romans in this very symbolic way of walking backwards through the Arch of Titus. So early in Domitian's reign, he really grabbed power. Um, he consolidated it for the imperial court. Um, unlike Vespasian, who was intent on making sure that power was shared between the imperial court and the Senate and equestrian classes so that everybody was participating. Domitian really blocks out the Senate and equestrian class. Essentially, the Senate no longer has a role under Domitian. They're rendered obsolete. 
he spent a significant amount of his time away from Rome, um, in part because military obligations demanded his presence, and he chose to carry them out himself rather than to send legates and remain in Rome overseeing the activities in Rome. In part because he was absent and not there sort of on the spot, he became increasingly paranoid. Um, and some of it was not actual paranoia. I mean, people were at various times out to get him. But he became really distrustful of even his close advisors and started to have both Senate members and family members killed, um, claiming that they were plotting to get him. It's unclear exactly how legitimate Domitian's suspicions were, um, but in fact, he was assassinated by a conspiracy of the Praetorian prefects in 96. So again, like Nero, he ends up with a less than glorious end, and this is the, the end of the, the Flavian dynasty. Um, he's stabbed in the groin, um, so in a, in a really symbolic way, they've had enough of him. Um, and it's a, it's a moment where he had previously enjoyed the support of the Praetorian Guard, the Praetorian prefects, but they finally have come around to see that Domitian is a tyrant, or at least that's how he's remembered. The Senate jumps on Domitian's assassination, and in fact was probably behind it, and immediately has him condemned. So rather than divinizing Domitian, the way even Nero was after his death, the Senate has him condemned, and they carry out a practice that was called Donatio Memoriae, or the condemnation of memory. And what this meant in practice was that every mention of Domitian, every image of Domitian was erased. So on public monuments, his name would be erased from an inscription, his face would be recarved into something else. It was as though he had never existed. Um, so a pretty serious kind of end. It's not just that you're dead, but it's, it's in fact, your entire life is erased. Um, and this was a practice that had existed before Domitian, um, but was used for the worst of Romans um, as a way of not just condemning them, but really making it as though they had never lived. Um, so removing any possibility that they would live on after death. And Domitian is remembered by ancient historians, really, as a tyrant and a megalomaniac, um, a sociopath. But the reality is the Roman people actually liked him. Um, he, had, he, was, he was a populist. And again, we have to sort of keep in mind that the historians were senators. Um, our, our Roman histories represent the views of the senatorial aristocracy. They didn't like Nero, they don't like Domitian, and part of that is that both of these men alienated the Senate, they blocked the Senate from power, and went directly to the people. Um, not unlike Julius Caesar, in fact, but one of the consequences of this behavior is that they're remembered by ancient historians as monsters, and that we never get the other side of the story. So we don't know how somebody sympathetic to Nero or sympathetic to Domitian would have told his reign, or even somebody that was neutral would have told the story of his reign. Following Domitian's assassination, the Senate declares Nerva as emperor. Um, Nerva was sort of the perfect candidate. He was old, he was 65 years old, and had just been kind of a good guy. He hadn't gotten too involved in imperial politics, but he, he knew his way around an imperial court. He'd served both, the Nero, both Nero and the Flavian families. Um, he understood how to govern, but was not involved in any of the sort of factionalization that had happened under both Nero and then Domitian. He will be remembered as the first of what are called the five good emperors. Um, and this is, is partly a construct of a, a modern historian, a relatively modern historian, Edward Gibbon, who sees the reign of Nerva as ushering in a period of peace and prosperity for Rome. Um, partly this is emphasizing certain parts of Roman society and ignoring particularly the plight of the poor. Um, life wasn't particularly any better if you were poor, if you didn't have land, um, if you didn't have really any way of making a living. So 
Nerva takes over in 96, but he struggles to really maintain power. He's the favorite of the Senate, but the Roman people in the army are skeptical, and he's never really in a secure position from the beginning. Um, he takes on really a strong populist program. He vows to restore the lost liberties, particularly to the Senate and equestrians, but also to some extent just to Roman people. He establishes a pretty sophisticated system of child support that's called the Alimenta. Um, and what the way that he funded this when there wasn't a lot of money was the imperial government, who controlled a certain amount of wealth, would make low interest loans to Italian landholders. And that interest then would be used to pay out this child support. And the child support really was just a payment of money to families who would ask for it to support young children and it would buy food based for them. It was a, a bit like food stamps. Um, one of the interesting things about it was that male children received more food than female children. And these are babies. so. Everybody roughly needed, had the same caloric needs, but you see the, the biases and the, the gender biases of Romans already at play with children. He also engaged in land distribution, and we've talked a lot about the, the incredible um, politics involved in the distribution of land in the late Republic. Well, it's now something Nerva recognizes that it would benefit Rome especially in the aftermath of 64, where a lot of, of poor Romans or middle-class Romans lost their land, that it would benefit the community as a whole if more people were landowners. And so he uses imperial money to buy land and then distributes that to people, Roman citizens that don't have it, especially citizens in Rome itself. Partly this is to get them out of Rome, um, but a lot of it is just to try to help them be able to make a living themselves and not be permanently dependent on the state for handouts. He also adopts Trajan as his heir, and he does this under some pressure by the, the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard had never really embraced Nerva, and they were threatening a revolt. There was a, a threat of a revolt by the troops. And so in order to forestall that and, and really pacify Rome and consolidate his reign, Nerva adopts Trajan. Trajan was a soldier, he's from Spain, and had rose to prominence largely under Domitian. Um, he will end up being our first emperor from the provinces, somebody who's not from Rome. Um, on the left hand side here you have Nerva in the pose of Jupiter, so apparently now it's okay um, for living emperors to be represented um, as gods. Nerva didn't live very long, so a bit like Titus, he had a very short reign. He did his job. Um, his job was to serve as a placeholder, and he did it well. Um, but he ends up dying of natural causes, or so it seems, after only two years in office. So he's got a, an heir in place in Trajan, but, and he's got a number of social programs that he's, he's started, but ends up dying before he can really see the, the consequences of his social programs. 